One of the most memorable parts of my first watch of Over the Garden Wall came in the ninth episode, as the show finally explained the outfits of our main duo. Throughout the previous eight quarter hours, the series has thrown so many things at the audience, so many surreal, impactful, or just really funny scenes, that it's quite easy to quickly get past the question of what exactly our brothers are wearing, perfectly setting up the reveal that this entire show takes place on Halloween and that the duo are simply wearing costumes, a realization that made me absolutely lose it nearly a decade ago. But that's not the only thing that episode 9, Into the Unknown, contextualizes for the rest of the series, as its placement at the beginning of the show's timeline allows us to get a peek into the boys' lives before their experiences in the miniseries, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Given today's date, as well as the fact that this show somehow turns 10 years old in like 3 days, I thought now would be a good time to take another look at this penultimate outing, and focus on all of the insights and atmospheric moments that it provides, as we see the life of Wirt and Greg before the unknown. Greg, it's Halloween. Candy is free. Old Lady Daniel says nothing in this world is free. One of the first things that Into the Unknown does is establish a couple of things about this episode, namely that it takes place both before the events of the rest of the series, and that the entire series seemingly takes place in the modern day. That second revelation is one that I especially want to zero in on for a second, as I think the way they handle doing this is actually quite indicative of how they'll handle everything else in this one, which is quite casually. While somebody on a first watch of Over the Garden Wall would almost certainly believe that our characters are from an earlier time until this exact moment, the show chooses to not portray this as the big reveal that it is, a level of sincerity that the rest of the episode carries as well. Anyway, this of course also comes with the Halloween costume reveal I touched on at the beginning of this video, but there is a little bit more to this one than I initially mentioned. Besides the reveal just being inherently funny, each of the brothers' outfits actually take on a more personal or character-revealing aspect within context. As Wirt chooses something with the goal of looking as cool as possible without any actual meaning, something reflective of his general dorky poetic nature throughout the show, while on the other hand, Greg simply wanted to be an elephant, chose an outfit that made him feel that way, and never gave outside perception a second thought. It's such a quick little detail here that's so easily permissible as a gag, but it's just one of the dozens of really neat little character moments that the show manages to cram into these 11 minutes. Before we move on to the rest of the episode, I can't believe I skipped past the song that kicks this one off, with Patrick McHale's sole vocal contribution to the show's soundtrack. And while lyrically, this one isn't exactly supremely deep diveable, besides a slightly eerie mention of a cold river, the angst in the instrumental here just works really well to both begin to make this episode feel like the 80s movie it wants to be, as well as making Wirt appear as the moody teen he wishes he was. It'll come back about halfway through the episode too, and it's just excellent at soundtracking Wirt's hopeless battle for Sarah's attention. Well, at least it's hopeless from his perspective. Speaking of which, it's this attraction for the girl under the mascot that propels the plot of this one along, with Wirt awkwardly missing every single opportunity to get what he wants, and Greg unknowingly forcing him to get a little bit closer to actually getting it. And while Wirt wanting to give Sarah a tape but being a bit too awkward to do it isn't exactly the most groundbreaking plot this series will ever muster, I do find it to work exceptionally well on several different fronts. For starters, with Wirt never having possession of the tape after about the 2 minute mark, the tension that that provides does a good job at creating some type of a time crunch, something that makes every little goofy interaction just that much funnier. 
On a much more impactful level though, this story is especially structured to emphasize the lack of confidence that's essentially defined Wirt throughout the series, both in giving him plenty of opportunities to clearly demonstrate it, while also showing the audience what it's costing him. Throughout this episode, Wirt is constantly either coming up with complicated schemes to get Sarah's attention, or moping around about the fact that he clearly has no chance. Meanwhile, we clearly see Sarah being heavily interested in Wirt at pretty much every single turn. She lights up when she sees him, tells Wirt she was looking for him, invites him to the graveyard, rejects the other guy trying to talk to her. Sarah makes it as obvious as possible that she's interested in Wirt, all while our protagonist is too busy yelling at his brother and coming up with poetry about how much nobody likes him. Getting back to that guy she rejects though, it's actually yet another example of this episode showcasing how misfounded and damaging Wirt's lack of confidence is. As the Jason Thunderbreaker he believes to be this more popular and suave version of himself is actually the only person in the entire show who's more of a dork than he is. Wirt has been so worried about everybody judging him that he's never actually looked around, something that would have likely told him that he's not exactly the odd man out that he thinks he is. It's mostly played for comedic effect here, and by the way, this is probably my pick for the funniest episode of this very funny show, but anyway, throughout this episode, Wirt is constantly talking about how awkward or weird an interaction is going to be, only for Greg to force him into it and everybody else to barely even react. Speaking of which, despite this episode perhaps being more explicitly about Wirt than any other in the show, there's still a good bit of Greg to be enjoyed, as he more or less forces his brother to participate in the plot. And while a good chunk of his dialogue here is just hilarious gag after hilarious gag, with his reaction to the police easily being my favorite bit here, there's also this constant contrast with his brother that illuminates Wirt's struggle a little bit more. Throughout this episode, Greg is able to walk up to people, usually people that Wirt knows and he doesn't, say exactly what he means, and yet is never met with any type of negative reaction. If Wirt's whole thing is turning mundane sentences into flowery yet ultimately meaningless poetry, then his brother consistently does the opposite, and it all works to create this dichotomy between the pair that facilitates the ending of this episode. See, after one final awkward moment at the graveyard, followed by a pseudo-police chase that ultimately sends our duo over the garden wall, Wirt tells his brother this. Once again, you ruin my life. Who, me? Oh, you and your stupid dad. And while this line from Wirt makes it seem like Greg is this newer addition to his life, that's just not the case. As Wirt kind of sings about in Songs of the Dark Lantern, he and Greg are half-brothers, not step-brothers, so he's been with Greg as long as Greg's been on this earth. But yet, despite this, and with no basis in reality, he continues to blame everybody but himself for the things that he does or doesn't do, spending what could have quite easily been their final moments yelling at his brother. His brother, who only wanted to help. I'm leaving. Hmm? Huh? Obviously, there's a bunch more stuff that one could talk about from this episode, from the countless references to events from the rest of the show, to the ending that gives us my favorite song of the soundtrack, Old Black Train, but I just want to focus on what this peek into the life of Wirt and Greg does for the other nine parts of Over the Garden Wall. As I've been talking about, the majority of this episode focuses on what Wirt's lack of self-assuredness is doing for him out in the real world, and that's also been a focus of a good chunk of the eight episodes that have preceded this one, just with a fairy tale angle. 
I mean, seriously, even with such a small sample size, almost every episode seems to highlight work to wanting to do something, failing to commit to actually doing it, shenanigans subsequently ensuing, and usually, in the end, it's Greg bailing them out. But even before this episode, there's definitely been a bit of a shift, as Wirt has started to figure this out too. Especially in episode 7, The Ringing of the Bell, I think it's pretty clear that Wirt, while obviously still being shy and awkward, is starting to do things that the Wirt of this episode simply wouldn't be able to do. And it's this growth that makes this episode's placement work really well. Even being short of two hours, Over the Garden Wall still found the time to flash back, highlighting just how far our protagonist has come throughout his time facing the unknown. But even with everything this episode does for the previous eight, I also think it's ultimately necessary to set up the finale that follows. In episode 10, The Unknown, seemingly titled to make conversation about this show as difficult as possible, we see Wirt entirely on his own, without his brother around, or at least able, to force him to do what he must but that doesn't stop our protagonist. While the words of the episode we've been discussing today would have never been able to stand up and be the brother that Greg so desperately needs, the new Wirt can and ultimately does. A newfound confidence that luckily happens to continue back in the real world and back with Sarah. So maybe we can listen to this. You can listen to it at my house, yes. Anyway, that's about it for me. If you went into this video expecting a different topic, then you probably had a pretty solid reason, as I more or less promised three different videos this month, none of which being this one. Long story short, and you can find the long story long in my community post tomorrow, but basically I hit a bit of a wall this month video wise, putting in literal dozens of hours of work without a single video to show for it. Currently, I'm working through both the Raven and Infinity Train Book 2 videos, both of which are seemingly going to be nearly an hour long each, so hopefully they'll be out next month. Again, if you want more information, there will be a community post tomorrow, and you can also follow me on Blue Sky for some more up-to-date stuff. Either way though, this has been Ample Samuel, please enjoy your Halloween, and I'll hopefully be back in a couple of days. Thanks for watching. Thank you.